Okay, uh, we could start, I suppose. Um, so I want to do two things this morning. I want to finish off talking about poverty, um, the crisis of poverty, which is our topic of the week. Um, this is a topic that, by the way, Professor Sachs is a world expert in. Um, he is, uh, he's written in a, a a, a book called um, The End of Poverty back in, I think, 2005, which really set the stage for what the United Nations did in terms of the Millennium, Devel Millennium Development Goals after that. He was an adv advisor to the Secretary General on ending poverty and later on, of course, on the Sustainable Development Goals, which we'll talk about in a few weeks' time. All that is just to say that uh, what you're getting from Professor Sachs is you're really getting from I would say the leading expert in global poverty in, in terms of economics in the world today. Um, and because of that, what I will be talking about is heavily influenced by Professor Sachs. It will continue. I've dropped a chapter from his book called The Age of Sustainable Development into Blackboard. The chapter is called Ending Extreme Poverty, and it's worth reading. Um, it's one of his textbooks that he uses for different types of courses. Uh, drop that in. I'll also be talking today about the Ethics in Action um, initiative that I was involved at the Vatican with Professor Sachs that brought together a lot of people from different religious traditions, different experts in different areas to talk about, talk about the ethical basis of solving major problems in sustainable development today. And of course, one of those problems is extreme poverty. And if you look at the MOOC, I believe the MOOC has a whole section on ending poverty, um, which I would uh, definitely recommend uh, you listen to, um, especially for this topic, uh, because, uh, yeah, yeah, especially for this topic. And you'll also find uh, things that you might be interested in there that we're not covering in this course. For example, you know, we talk a lot about the Aristotelian tradition and the the uh, Jewish Catholic tradition uh, of, um, uh, of, uh, of ethics. But um, there are other traditions in ethics and action that we're not covering in this course, like the Confucian tradition, the Buddhist tradition, the Hindu tradition. And there are sections in that MOOC that will have experts explain some of those topics to you because the bottom line, just to give the bottom line as to where I'm going, is there is an ethical consensus across all the religious and secular ethical traditions in the world today that ending extreme poverty is a moral imperative. Um, there are a couple of exceptions to that, and I think you can guess what they are, but we'll talk about that uh, as we get along. So I'll, I'll continue uh, talking about uh, ending extreme poverty. Um, I don't think it's going to take up the full hour, but I, I wanted to block off some time to talk about your next assignment. Oh yeah, that's coming up by the way. Um, uh, but don't worry, you, I think you'll enjoy this one like you enjoyed the last one, uh, Alex, and I'll talk about that uh, in, in, a, in a little bit. Okay, let me do the, do the technical stuff, the screen share. And where is it? There it is. Let me start with uh, some facts. I mean, I'll just start by saying that, you know, one of the main facts that you, you heard from Professor Sachs was um, one reason why extreme poverty is such a scandal is that we live in the very rich world, a world in which eliminating extreme poverty is actually not that hard because we're so rich. The, the global economy and international prices is around $128 trillion. Um, that gives an average income of around $17,000 per person in the world today. Um, but of course, that's not the way it's divided because there's huge inequality. So there's a billion people living in high income countries where their average income is around 45,000 a person. 
and there's a billion living in low income countries where the average is basically only about $800 a person a year. So huge, huge global inequality. And as you can see from the chart, the World Bank keeps track of uh, the numbers of people in extreme poverty, which defined as Professor Sachs noted on Tuesday as those earning less than $1.90 a day in international prices. Um, that number, I think the latest number is in 2017. There's always a few years lag because it's, it, it's hard to measure this uh, in real time. The latest number I saw, I just looked this up recently, is 689 million people living on extreme poverty. That's under $1.90 a day. Now, that, um, there's been tremendous progress over the last few decades. In 1990, that number was 2 billion people. Um, 1990 is not that long ago, um, uh, 2 billion people. But also, if you look at the other dimensions of extreme poverty, you can also see there's a lot of suffering and a lot of deprivation in the world. So 820 million people suffer from hunger. So more people suffer from hunger than actually live in extreme poverty. And that's especially scandalous when you realize that something like a third of all food is wasted, it's thrown away today. Pope Francis talks about a throwaway culture. Uh, and certainly when it comes to food, uh, that's definitely the case. There are 6 million children under the age of five who die every year from easily preventable diseases that could be solved with basic medical interventions. Uh, we simply choose not to do that, um, uh, which is uh, another source of, uh, of, global, of global scandal. About a billion people lack electricity uh, and a mass of 3 billion people for energy rely on wood and biomass, which of course creates terrible pollution and health problems. I think around 5 million people a year die from pollution, um, especially in, in countries like India and China, um, which uh, it's, it's especially from burning coal and, uh, and things like that. Um, there is a 20 year gap in life expectancy between rich and poor countries. Um, Again, that's another measure of poverty is that people who are poor die younger. Um, and of course, when it comes to health and education, that's also a measure of poverty in the multidimensional sense. Uh, if you think about health, health and poverty are intrinsically related. Uh, people who are poor tend to have worse health because they can't afford doctors, they can't afford basic medical treatment, but also the causality works both ways. Um, poverty causes bad health and bad health also leads to poverty. Uh, so there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a bi-causal uh, direction going on there. There's also uh, huge inequalities in educational attainment. Um, so six in 10 children in the world today lack basic proficiency in um, in reading and, and mathematics. Uh, and another statistic I can give you is that in sub-Saharan Africa, which is the country today, which is, as Professor Sachs noted, the, the kind of the ground zero of extreme poverty there, the secondary school completion rate is only 28% for boys and only 21% for girls. So that's another, another educational figure when you realize. And of course, it doesn't, it, it, common sense would tell you if you want to escape extreme poverty, if you want to escape any poverty and create a living, you need the basics of education. And if you don't have education, it's very hard to escape extreme poverty. Um, I didn't put this in the chart, but you know, that's absolute poverty in terms of relative poverty. You know, the U.S. has a, has a very high poverty rate. Uh, I think it's around 17% or something like that, uh, which is especially pronounced 
uh, in minorities, especially in the African American community, where you have entrenched poverty, mass incarceration, terrible social problems, high levels of violence, and worse health and life expectancy. And we, you know, we're seeing with the COVID outbreak that it's actually in the U.S. It's minorities um, who are suffering and dying uh, at a much greater rate than um, than than white people or wealthy people. Um, so, when it comes to all dimensions, you basically see uh, whether we talk about extreme poverty or whether we talk about relative poverty, uh, there are huge uh, inequalities across all across many dimensions, um, income, health, education, uh, uh, energy. I could I could easily talk about water and sanitation, like uh, many of the basic material bases for human flourishing. Uh, people lack when they get when they're poor. Like for example, water and sanitation. There are millions uh, in sub-Saharan Africa who lack clean water. But also, you know, from Flint, Michigan, there are plenty of Americans who lack um, wa clean water too, uh, which is also a, a, a moral scandal. Okay, so that's just some basic facts. Now, you, you might ask the next question, what are the drivers of extreme poverty? Well, if somebody comes along and tells you there's poverty is caused by one thing, I have one you know, one, you know, magic uh, driver of poverty. Um, you can pretty much discount that because there isn't one thing. There is usually a whole bunch of things that work together. Uh, a lot of fact, poverty is caused by a lot of factors. Most basically, poverty is caused by a poverty trap, which simply says the country is, is too poor to make the basic investments needed to end deprivation in areas like health and education in water and sanitation in agricultural productivity uh, in infrastructure so in all these areas we need investments uh, in to escape extreme poverty but often and um, we'll see this later especially when we talk about financing the sustainable development goals but often um, the, 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 the amount of money needed to finance these um, uh, investments to end extreme poverty is small for the world, but is actually very big for the country itself. So the country can't actually afford um, to make these investments. Sometimes it can be up as, as high as 20% of a country's GDP because the GDP is quite low. So it's very hard. How do you raise 20% of GDP? You can't, you can't raise it in taxes. That's, that's just too, way too big to raise in taxes. So how do you do it? So you can't on your own. So you're stuck in poverty. You have a poverty trap. Uh, another driver of extreme poverty is simply bad economic policies, policies that worsen economic growth, that worsen income distribution and inequality. Um, for example, closing borders to trade and foreign investment, relying on central planning or, in, uh, or inflationary finance of, um, sorry, of, um, of, of government uh, spending. So there's a whole bunch of bad economic policies that can uh, set back your economic development. And because one thing we, we need to understand is ending extreme poverty, uh, you need a combination of high economic growth, but you also need a lot of global solidarity because of that poverty trap that I, that I mentioned. Uh, you can't escape extreme poverty on your own. You need help, but you need to start somewhere and you need to start with good economic policies. Now, one particular bad economic policy that we see that we've seen over and over again is financial insolvency. Uh, and that's when governments borrow too much uh, and it pushes them into a debt trap. Um, and so you get into this debt trap, uh, countries um, uh, will borrow money um, 
lenders will think that they can't repay. So the interest rates that will be charged on any future loans will be much higher, which in turn increases, makes the insolvency even worse. And so you end up paying money on interest payments, which diverts money away from needed investments in things like health, education, social services, water and sanitation, agricultural productivity, infrastructure, all those areas you need to end extreme poverty. So that's financial insolvency. And you see that not just in the poorest countries in the world, but also some middle income countries, for example, in Argentina, uh, we see this, uh, we've seen this over the last few years. Um, when you overborrow, you get into this uh, debt trap. Okay, another issue is the impediments of physical geography. And this is, you know, this is, this is very important, which tends to be downplayed by many economists who focus only on policies. But it's not just policies, it's the physical environment in which you're living. Um, so, for example, if you're landlocked, if you, lack, if you lack access to ports, you have a really hard time escaping poverty. If you're mountainous, uh, if, you, uh, if you don't have good soil, uh, your agricultural productivity is going to suffer. Another aspect of geography is if you're prone to diseases. So for example, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has the great misfortune of being prone to many, many, many uh, uh, diseases like malaria that uh, really uh, inhibit, that cause a lot of deaths, that cause a lot of suffering, but also reduce your economic growth and your ability to escape poverty. A further aspect of geography is being vulnerable to natural disasters such as droughts and floods. Uh, we know that um, these droughts and floods and natural disasters are made much worse by climate change and the lack and the destruction of biodiversity. And a lot of the poorest regions in the world are especially vulnerable to these droughts and floods. Uh, if you look at um, in Central America and the Caribbean, you see a lot of uh, hurricanes and floods, uh, which causes great human suffering, which in turn causes a lot of migration towards the US. Um, you see the same thing in, in places like uh, Syria, which suffered um, from 2006 to 2010, one of the worst droughts in recorded history. Uh, and that was one of the catalysts for the war in Syria. Um, you don't often read in the newspapers that climate change was a contributing factor towards the Syrian civil war, but it was. And likewise, in parts of Africa, you're seeing a lot of droughts, which causes a lot of political instability in countries like Nigeria and Chad. Um, you pretty much anytime you read about uh, the the rise of domestic political instability or terrorism or extremism, you can often trace that to climate change and drought. For example, I'll give you one uh, classic example uh, in northern Nigeria in the Sahel region. Um, the, you know, because of droughts, the Sahara Desert is expanding southwards and the people who were uh, the the pastoralists uh, who lived in that region are also migrating south to escape the desert but they're encroaching on farmland where there are settled farmers so there's competition for resources and one of the problems is that the pastoralists are predominantly muslim the farmers are predominantly Christian. So this struggle for resources takes on a dangerous uh, religious uh, uh, connotation, um, which is, creates all kinds of problems. And you hear stories of Boko Haram in Nigeria and kidnapping children and all that stuff. That instability is traced, can be traced in large amounts to um, 
the being prone to being vulnerable to natural disasters in this particular case to droughts. Okay, that's geography. Another driver of extreme poverty is weak governance or corruption, corruption uh, and a lack of transparency. So as Professor Sachs noticed, noted, a lot of the opposition to giving foreign aid is, is, is the, you will throw your hands in the air and say, oh, but there's so much corruption in that country. Um, of course, I would, we would both argue that there is a lot of corruption in rich countries too. Uh, if you just go to Wall Street, you'll see <laughs> uh, tremendous amounts of corruption uh, and uh, bad uh, unethical practices going on there. So you don't have to go to some of the poorest countries in the world. But nonetheless, there is an issue with corruption. There is an issue that sometimes you have um, a diversion of funds. Uh, in the past, uh, if you look at some of the dictators in certain African countries, they became extremely wealthy uh, over, uh, well, their people uh, lived in extreme poverty, uh, like, um, like President Mobutu from Zaire, for example. And there are plenty of examples, uh, less so today. Less so today, by the way, this is, uh, was most more pronounced in the past. The current crop of leaders uh, are thankfully um, of higher quality and more honest. Uh, but still, corruption is a problem in all countries of the world um, and institutions. So there are many people who claim that institutions uh, are the main driver of poverty. Uh, again, I would caution you away from any simplistic argument that relies on one factor. Um, there was a famous book written a few years ago called Why Nations Fail by um, Asimolu and Robinson, which argued that, well, poverty and uh, state failure is caused by institutional problems. Um, they distinguish between um, inclusive institutions which respected the rule of law and property rights and things like that, and extractive institutions where governments and elites were basically just trying to extract value from the economy without making the kinds of investments you need to end extreme poverty. And, you know, that's, that's not wrong in certain cases, um, but it's also too simplistic uh, to say that that's everything is caused by that. Um, like I just mentioned, the importance of geography, uh, geographical uh, impediments um, to eliminating extreme poverty. That's also very, very important. Another factor is cultural barriers. And, you know, this can take on many different dimensions. The, the one I want to mention is uh, in many cultures where girls and women face discrimination an impediment to human flourishing uh, due to cultural factors that can perpetuate poverty, uh, especially among women. And one big problem there is when girls are unable to attend school. If girls are unable to attend school, uh, their future potential is vastly diminished and they can't, and it's very hard for them to escape poverty. It's very hard for them to escape discrimination uh, in the particular societies. So that's cultural barriers. And if you think about it, there are probably many others, but that's the one I wanted to mention. There are also political factors, um, things like wars, political instability, um, especially during the Cold War, many poor countries were treated as pawns in the power games of great powers, the stage for proxy wars and campaigns of destabilization. Um, we saw that so many times. Um, and war is still a leading factor uh, in the battle to eliminate extreme poverty, uh, political instability. We see this in many countries today. Thankfully, the incidence of war is much lower today than it was maybe 30 or 40 years ago, which is a very good sign. But the problem is, as climate change gets worse, we're more likely to see war and violence and instability 
uh, within countries. So these things are all related, uh, violence, poverty, uh, climate change. So that's, that's political factors. That also includes, as I mentioned, geopolitical factors where major powers try to destabilize countries uh, or to, to keep them uh, in, in train. By the way, uh, I should mention that colonialism was uh, up until the 1940s and 1950s, colonialism was the ultimate political factor that held countries back. Um, colonies, uh, the idea was you treated your colony as basically a source of cheap raw materials and to make sure you had a constant supply of those cheap raw materials, you made sure that that country did not develop, that the people were not educated. Uh, you, wanted to, you wanted to hold it back because all you wanted was a cheap source of raw materials. That was one of the great evils of colonialism. And the problem with a lot of countries in Africa in particular is the colonies left behind terrible, uh, sorry, the, the colonizing powers left behind terrible legacies of underdevelopment, um, they didn't build infrastructure. They didn't build. They didn't foster education. Um, um, they they left behind weak institutions, and uh, even today, these things are generations in the making, and it ta often takes generations to solve some of these problems. Um, and it's no surprise today that some of the poorest countries in the world were those countries that were colonies of European countries and were deliberately and viciously held back uh, from their own developments. Uh, the final factor I wanted to mention in the drivers of poverty is ideological barriers. Um, here we've talked about um, a couple here. The main one is libertarianism, I would argue, that works against solidarity, both within countries and between countries. This basically says that market rewards are fairly earned, they're justly earned, and the government has no role in impeding the natural forces of the market or making sure you transfer resources from rich countries to poor countries. Um, in other words, a libertarian pretty much says you're all on your own. Um, as Professor Sachs says, there is a, um, a Calvinism turned out to be another uh, religious, I would say, um, barrier to the elimination of extreme poverty because Calvinism says, you know, you don't know if you're part of the... Uh, Calvinism basically says that um, you are either part of the elect who are saved or you're damned. And that was chosen before you were born. There's nothing you can do about it. So this is the inscrutable will of God. Uh, but you often, this, some of the signs of being elect, of being favored by God, are that you're wealthy, you, have, you, you, get, you gain wealth. Uh, and therefore, if you're poor, it's, it, it's God's will, and you don't want to interfere with God's will, because it shows you're not part of the elect. I think this is a, a real, I mean, we've talked about the the Jewish, the Hebrew scriptures. We've talked about the Christian tradition in, in earlier classes. I think this is a huge distortion of what Christianity is all about. And the worst version of that comes with the prosperity gospel, which you see in a lot of evangelical mega churches today, which basically says that, you know, God wants you to be rich. Uh, if you pray hard enough, you'll get rich. If you donate enough to the certain church, you'll get rich. Um, of course, in the, of the historical Christian tradition, you have the universal destination of goods, you have the preferential option for the poor, and you have the notion that God is especially close to the poor, so that, um, so that you want to make sure you take care of the poor uh, and, 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 and have compassion and love toward them. So that's some of the ideological barriers that uh, work against uh, the elimination of extreme poverty. Before I move on, I wanna talk about the problem with Africa is a lot of these factors come together to, to hold Sub-Saharan Africa back. Um, they're too poor, they're locked in the poverty trap because they're so poor. Uh, 
in terms of geography, one third of the countries are landlocked. They lack access to the sea. They lack access to ports. They're cursed with a high burden of infectious diseases, especially from those blasted mosquitoes, uh, um, which cause such uh, devastation. Their crop productivity is low as the soil quality is often low. And finally, the colonial legacy, mainly by Britain and France, left behind lousy infrastructure, weak institutions, uh, including a wholly inadequate educational system. Um, so it's, it's, it's fair that we can blame the colonies for all of that. So that's some of the drivers of extreme poverty. There is also, I would argue, a moral consensus on eliminating extreme poverty. Um, and this is when we, in the Ethics in Action um, co uh, uh, initiative, uh, we talked a lot about this. And I said, you know, this is, um, we won't talk today about Confucianism or Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam, but they also are part of this moral consensus on ending extreme poverty. Um, because there's a fundament, at a fundamental level uh, across all different traditions, human beings simply do not want to inflict suffering on other human beings. There is a golden rule across cultures, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And this transcends all the religious traditions of the world today uh, at a very basic level. We've talked about Catholic social teaching. We've talked about the Hebrew scriptures we talked about how, um, how God, um, the injunction is to take care of the poor from the earliest days of the Hebrew scriptures. Um, treat the poor as yourself. Leave the gleanings of the field for the poor. Relieve debts every seven years as part of the sabbatical. Restore uh, crop rights and land rights every 50 years as part of the jubilee. There's a strong injunction that you that the poor take priority in your policy making in the Hebrew scriptures. And, and we talked a lot. We spent a whole class on Catholic social teaching predicated on such um, principles as human dignity, the common good, uh, the virtue of solidarity, and that solidarity must apply within a country, but also between countries. We talked about the principles of the universal destination of goods, uh, that the goods of the earth belong to all without exclusion, without exception. We talked about the preferential option for the poor, that the poor must take precedence uh, in all uh, policy making. And, and I would say again, just to repeat, the other religious traditions agree on this moral imperative to end poverty. They are all in some sense predicated on this relationship between the dignity of the human person and the common good. And, uh, and if, you have, if you have a, a policy, politics based on the common good, then clearly you will want to end extreme poverty. So that's the religious traditions. I think that the secular traditions also um, would also um, cohere in a certain sense with that. Utilitarianism, as we discussed, I think in the second class, is about the greatest happiness of the greatest number. And one strand of utilitarianism says that this greatest happiness of the greatest number is maximized when resources are transferred from the wealthy to the poor. And remember, uh, one of the leading exponents of modern utilitarianism is the Princeton economist Peter Singer, who, has a, who comes up with a movement called Effective Altruism, where he basically argues that uh, your goal in life should be to relieve as much suffering as possible. And uh, so one thing you can do is you can, you, you know, a lot of ethics says, a lot of ethical traditions say that you know, how you earn your money has an ethical dimension. Peter Singer would argue, if you need to go work for a hedge fund, go work for a hedge fund, make as much money as possible so you can do good with that money. Um, you can pick the best 
Effective altruism means you do your research, you find the best charities, and you make sure you use your money to relieve as much suffering as possible. Um, he was the one who came up with the idea of the little girl drowning in the pool. Um, and you have, a fancy, you have your fancy shoes, remember? He argued that, would you rescue the girl drowning in the pool? Of course you would. Um, your shoes be damned. And so, and then he argued that, well, let's assume it's not a girl drowning in a pool, but it's a girl dying of malaria uh, in a far distant country that, and it's not your shoes, but it's a small part of your income to save that girl. Would you do it? Uh, and he said, if you should, of course, do it because that's about maximizing the greatest happiness of the greatest number. But remember, utilitarianism has a dark side, as we talked about this too, I believe, in the second class. And that's, if you're talking about the greatest happiness of the greatest number, you can have a lot of exclusion in that. And neoclassical economics arises from utilitarianism. The notion of Pareto efficiency, remember, is the idea that... Um, you um you 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 maximize the so you maximize uh, the satisfaction of your preferences to the point where no voluntary transfers no no voluntary uh, transfers have not been satisfied so you can't make somebody better off without making somebody worse off uh, of course you know you can be Pareto efficient and very equal but you can be Pareto efficient and very and very unequal uh, and as as the great uh, economist and philosopher Amartya Sen said, you can be Pareto efficient and perfectly disgusting. So utilitarianism has two strands. Um, there's a kind of the effect, the Peter Singer effect of altruism strand, but also the kind of the neoclassical tradition strand, which says that you can't make comparisons between people and the only standard is really Pareto efficiency. Um, Virtue ethics, we've talked about that. That goes back to our old friend Aristotle, who I'm sure you're tired of hearing about at this point. Um, Aristotle, and, um, and I won't say Aristotle himself, because Aristotle, you know, the idea of uh, uh, Aristotle believed in natural inequalities, as you know, he didn't think much of uh, the role of women and the role of slaves. But I think we need to distinguish between Aristotle himself and virtue ethics, which comes from the Aristotelian tradition. And here, the scan, it's, if, if you want to achieve eudaimonia, if you want to achieve a holistic human flourishing in life to develop your capacities to the greatest extent possible and become the best version of yourself, then you're blocked from doing all that by extreme material deprivation. Poverty leads to the, the, the weakness of the capacity to be and to act. You're no longer able to unfold your capacity or develop your potential across all dimensions of life. And that, of course, also undermines the common good. And this points to a kind of the multidimensional poverty. If you're, you're blocked, if you're poor, if you lack income, if you lack, if you have if you like health care, if you like education, if you like shelter, food, water and sanitation, energy, you need all of these, the basic material bases of human flourishing to become the best version of yourself. So virtue ethics points towards the multidimensional aspect of poverty. This is closely related to what's called the capability approach to development which is associated with Amartya Sen, who we've already mentioned, who's, who's an economist and philosopher, a Nobel Prize winner, a, a brilliant thinker, and also a philosopher called Martha Nussbaum. Um, isn't it good that we're finally coming, we're finally uh, finding, mentioning women? Unfortunately, our course has been way too many men. So I can safely say that Martha Nussbaum is a top quality, top philosopher and one of the developers of the capability approach. Capability said, and the, the, the criticism here is, it says what you really care about is not just money. It's not just income. It's what you can do with that. Do you have the freedom to do or to be what you value doing or being? 
So it's very close to virtue ethics. It's very close to the old idea of human flourishing. Um, can you do or be what you value doing or being? It has been criticized as being still a little too individualistic. It's about you personally developing yourself. Um, it's been criticized as a little disconnected from the common good. Um, so to do it right, you need to direct those capabilities once exercised towards the common good as part of living the good life together in society. Um, it's tied to communal obligation. So in a sense, it's related to the Catholic principle of integral human development, which, as you will recall, is the development of the whole person and all people. So the capability approach is really the development of the whole person. Um, it's been criticized um, for, for focusing less on the all people uh, dimension, the common good, but it certainly is, uh, we can actually extend it in that direction without much problem. John Rawls, uh, we also spent a lot of time talking about John Rawls. John Rawls said that his ethics is basically you look at the welfare of the least advantaged person in society uh, from behind the veil of ignorance, uh, because that's what you would choose not knowing uh, where you're going to end up in society. And you want more primary goods, which he defines as liberties, opportunities, income, and wealth. This, by the way, is what Amartya Sen criticized in the capability approach. He criticized his emphasis on resources like income and wealth, whereas he said it's more about capabilities, the freedom to be able to not just having money, it's what can you do with that money? And you have the capability to unfold uh, your, your dignity. Uh, but this is uh, John Rawls. And John Rawls said one implication there is there is a role for the public authorities to make sure that the basic social and economic needs are met. So the kind of needs, the social, the human rights tradition from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, the Rawlsian tradition will be very coherent with that. It's that you are, um, you are, you you have a right to these basic social and economic needs to have them met. You have a right to these primary goods. Um, so many, many different uh, traditions, both religious, both non-religious. They all point towards alleviating poverty and alleviating suffering. Uh, and I, I mentioned again, the exceptions are libertarianism and Calvinism, already talked about that, so don't need to repeat myself there. Next step is, how do we end extreme poverty? Well, first thing is, you meet basic needs like health, education, food security, clean water and sanitation, and I would argue that education and health for children is especially, especially important. Um, and that must be met, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, because that is not just, remember the poverty trap, that cannot be just a, a, a moral imperative for the country itself. It's a moral imperative for the whole world, because often these needs are difficult for the country itself to solve uh, because of poverty traps. You also need peace. Um, and there's a vicious circle here, a vicious cycle, because poverty contributes to violence and violence contributes to poverty. And it's also related to climate change. I go back to the example of the civil war in Syria that I, that I, that I gave you uh, earlier. Um, but basically you need to solve peace. And, you know, in the Ethics in Action initiative, one of our partners was a group called Religions for Peace. And Religions for Peace argue that peace is not just negative in the sense of the absence of conflict, but it's also positive peace in the sense that do you have the preconditions for authentic human flourishing in place? Um, and that's very important too. It's, uh, it goes, it goes to the kind of the, the Aristotelian 
notions that we have been talking about in terms of meeting a meeting the basic needs, uh, the basic material basis of human flourishing. So we need peace. We also need to solve climate change because climate change is intrinsically related to poverty. As we mentioned, droughts um, in Africa is a huge cause of poverty. Um, hurricanes in the Caribbean and Central America is a huge cause of poverty. All of this leads to migration which destabilizes other countries. It creates a refugee crisis, uh, all related to climate change, which will, as you know, and we'll talk about this in a few weeks' time, will get dramatically worse as the century progresses if we do not take actions to solve climate change. Um, you, you should expect a lot more poverty and a lot more destabilization. I believe, and look this up because I'm not sure that this is right. This is just uh, trying to remember from the top of my head. But I believe the World Bank says climate change could create up to 100 million um, uh, people in extreme poverty uh, if we don't solve it. So a lot of the progress in reducing extreme poverty could be undermined by climate change. There are also you need, as, as well as all this, you need specific interventions for pockets of poverty. Uh, uh, one example here, which we talked about again in the Ethics in Action Initiative, is uh, indigenous populations, uh, especially in the Americas, uh, who were historically pushed to the margins and continue to face great hardship, deprivation, and indignities all over the world. We have minority communi communities that are discriminated against. We have girls and women that are discriminated against. So you often need specific interventions uh, to help particular groups of people that face specific hardships and the specific forms of discrimination. Um, now, all of this requires global solidarity, especially the first point, meaning basic needs like health, education, infrastructure, sanitation and water. Uh, it requires global solidarity in the terms of in terms of uh, foreign aid or ODA uh, official development assistance. This is foreign aid. It's financial transfers from rich countries to poor countries. Now the rich countries have agreed that they would um, transfer. They in ideal circumstances they would transfer. 0.7% of gross national income every year to poor countries to help them develop. The problem is very few countries meet that standard. This is a, a map of official development assistance as a percentage of GNI uh, across countries. And as you can see, the standard is, the agreed standard is 0.7. Very few countries meet that. Uh, in fact, I think only six countries meet it. It's Sweden, Norway, Luxembourg, Denmark, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. Only these, and some of them are actually backsliding. Some of them are actually backsliding with the COVID crisis uh, because they tend to put their own countries uh, first when they face a different crisis. Um, so very few countries deploy the agreed target of 0.7% of uh, of gross national income. The, the average is closer to 0.3%. So the global shortfall is around 0.4% of high income GDP, which is around $200 billion every year. Keep that figure in mind, $200 billion a year uh, shortfall in terms of, uh, of, of the development. What about ending relative poverty within countries, countries like the United States? And I will go quickly here because we've seen a lot of this before because ending relative poverty and ending and reducing inequality are two sides of the same coin. So one thing is you want fiscal redistribution. You want to make sure that all have access to good social services like quality education and healthcare and childcare, uh, parental leave, 
um, maternal leave, all these kind of basic social services that are needed to be able to reduce uh, relative poverty and to foster the kind of integral human development you need to flourish. Uh, and that it should be funded by progressive taxation um, to make sure that it's uh, fairly apportioned. You also want uh, an empowered and responsible workers movement. This is yet another dimension of solidarity. We talked about that. First of and foremost, it boosts wages for workers, but it also acts as a counterweight against corporate power, which as, uh, which as we talked about before has become very pronounced in recent decades. We also talked, when we talked about uh, inequality, we talked about such factors as profit sharing uh, through cooperatives, worker ownership of, uh, of companies or sharing in the profits or co-determination, which is where workers uh, have a seat both on boards of governance and also in work councils, which determine how the firm is run at the firm level. Uh, very, it's a central European thing, especially pronounced in Germany. And the result shows there that you get very positive results. You get much less wage inequality. You get much less strife within firms. You get more investment uh, and, and strong, strong, strong um, uh, growth. And finally, the universal basic income, uh, which has, uh, again, once again, I'm mentioning it, but once again, I'm gonna gloss over it because you all did the, did the homework on this. So you probably know more about this than I do at this point. But, you know, the universal basic income has become very popular as, a, as an income transfer uh, to people to, uh, and, you know, it, 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 it's, 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 um, main advantage is it can really reduce relative poverty. It can reduce inequality in the country. Its disadvantage is that it um, is expensive. And also that, this is a more subtle point, but another disadvantage is that in terms of, you, in the Aristotelian sense, remember what people really want is not just income, it's, the ability to make a good social contribution. So if you have a two-tiered world where um, you have massive technological change and the benefits of technology are hogged by a small number and they basically buy off the rest of the population with a universal basic income who have very little opportunity to kind of work is that really, um, does that really need to human flourishing? That's an open question. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe people are unhappy. Maybe people are kind of marginalized in this kind of two-tier system. Or maybe it does. Maybe they can find meaningful uh, work in care work or in charity work or in the kinds of leisure activities that John Maynard Keynes talked about in the quote that Professor Sachs talked about, the economic opportunities for our grandchildren. But the question to, to question to basically ask is not just do you have enough money as important as that is, but can you find meaning? Can you develop your capacities and capabilities with the money that you have? So that's the UBI. And again, I, I will um, skip over it. I won't say much more about that because you all did uh, excellent essays on, on the UBI. Now, this chart is from is, is what I call the ethical misallocation of resources. Um, and this is, think of this as a moral ledger of, of, of finance in the world today. This comes by the way, from the Ethics and Action Initiative and it was put together by Professor Sachs. So remember world income today is $128 trillion. The poverty gap, the annual cost of meeting the basic needs of all people in the world today is three to $400 billion. Now, remember what I just said about the gap in official development assistance. It's $200 billion. So you could, if countries made their agreed 
um, uh, met their agreement in terms of foreign aid and in, in terms of official development assistance, they could go a long way towards meeting the basic material needs of all people in the world today and ending extreme poverty. Um, when you look at some of the more specific interventions, the numbers are on the global scale are tiny. The amount of money it would cost to save 5 million children's lives is only $20 billion. The amount of money it causes to, to end the AIDS epidemic by 2030 is only $40 billion. The amount of money it costs to provide universal education to secondary level for all children in low income countries is again, $40 billion. The annual cost of solving climate change, moving to a decarbonized energy system is a little more expensive, but it's $1 trillion, but that's very small in a, and in a global economy of $128 trillion. Uh, and especially when you think about the costs of climate change, which are much, much higher than that. And the annual cost of proving, sorry, that's a typo, providing clean energy to the bottom 3 billion is $200 billion. Again, remember those, the, the, the 3 billion people who use, who rely on polluting wood and biomass for their energy. Uh, it's possible to, to provide clean, especially solar energy to those people for $200 billion. Again, um, not that much in the scheme of the global economy. So that's what we do not. This is what we, we choose as a global economy not to spend that money. We choose. But what do we, cho where, what, what, what do we choose in terms of the ethical allocation of resources? Well, the global wealth of billionaires is $9.1 trillion. The annual military spending every year is between one and a half and two trillion dollars. That money has been spent on weapons of war. We choose to subsidize fossil fuels. Uh, the IMF estimates that the after-tax fossil fuel subsidies in the world today are $540 billion. That's more than half of what it would cost to solve climate change. The money stashed away in tax havens is between 20 and $30 trillion. That's an estimate because obviously they don't keep records in tax havens uh, as to what they're hiding. Uh, so again, think about that in terms of, that's a staggering proportion of world GDP is stashed away in tax havens. In 2016, it's a little out of date, but it hasn't changed very much. The pay of the top 10 hedge fund CEOs is around $10 billion and the annual profits from modern slavery is $150 uh, billion. Uh, so basically, we live in a world where there is a tremendous amount of suffering, but also a tremendous amount of ethical misallocation of resources. And this is our choice. Now, In 2000, we had the Millennial Development Goals, which Millennium Development Goals, which Professor Sachs was instrumental in, by the way, in introducing. Um, and they were saying by 2015, we want to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equality and empower women, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, ensure environmental sustainability, and develop a partnership for development. Now, these Millennium Development Goals turned out to be incredibly successful. They didn't eliminate extreme poverty. We, we already saw almost 700 million people still live in extreme poverty, but they lifted a billion people out of poverty. Remember in 1990, there were 2 billion people living in poverty. Now it's around 689 million people. The proportion of undernourished people fell by half since 1990. Almost 2 billion people got access to piped drinking water. Maternal mortality was halved and most of that happened after the year 2000. 
the number of children who died before their fifth birthday fell from 12 million a year in 1990 to 6 million a year. Sorry, 6 million a year. I wrote billion. I'm always making that mistake. Uh, a year by 2015. 2015 being the last year of the Millennium Development Goals. New HIV infections fell by 40% uh, between 2020 and 2013. Over 6 million lives were saved from malaria owing to cheap and simple interventions like insecticide-treated mosquito nets. And primary school net enrollment rose from 83% in 2000 to 91% in 2015. Uh, and the number of primary age children out of school declined by almost half to 57 uh, million. Now, so Millennium Development Goals show clearly that global solidarity works. If the world comes together with a clear goal in mind, it can actually work. Um, but it worked more in some areas than in others. Uh, it worked very well in health. Um, the, in health, uh, health outcomes improved dramatically. It worked fairly well in education. It didn't really work well at all in, in environmental sustainability because very little progress was achieved. But that's where the sustainable development goals come in. The sustainable development goals are the successor to the millennium development goals. And I won't say any more about that because we have a whole class devoted to that uh, in a few weeks time. And again, Professor Sachs was instrumental in setting up the sustainable development goals. So the MDGs were hugely successful. And the moral of that story is that um, you can get, uh, you can get um, if you put your mind to it, if the world puts its mind and puts its resources to it, uh, you can actually do great things in terms of alle alleviating poverty and deprivation. Uh, the Ethics and in Action Initiative proposed a number of measures to eliminate uh, global poverty, which I'll just mention here. Uh, establish a global fund for education to mobilize that $40 billion I mentioned that's needed to provide universal secondary education every year. Divert 10% of military spending um, to, uh, to reduce poverty. Uh, call that the Isaiah Fund because Isaiah talked about beating your swords into plowshares or the Pope Paul VI Fund because in Pope Paul VI also called for a world fund to, to divert military spending um, towards development. Pope Paul said development is the new name for peace. Tax anonymous wealth in tax havens. Establish a billionaire's fund to endow the sustainable development goals and urge all wealthy countries uh, to honor the commitment of 0.7% of GDP and ODA. There were other, uh, I'm, I'm gonna stop the share there because I wanna talk about the homework. Um, there is uh, other uh, proposals we had social activism for the poor, uh, supporting grassroots roots movements and unions, and prioritizing ownership rights of slum dwellers and smallholders in poor countries. So, because the idea is not just to provide financial resources to the poor, but allow them to become active agents of their own development. That's a core part of integral human development in Catholic social teaching. So, that's my that's the lecture I wanted to give on on poverty. We covered a lot of ground. We covered a lot of ground we, uh, on Tuesday. We covered a lot of ground today. Um, read um, Professor Sachs's chapter on ending extreme poverty, which I put in Blackboard. I can also put a small paper that I wrote with Professor Sachs and two other people that has this ethical misallocation of resources. Uh, uh, I will also drop that on the blackboard, I think, so you can have a look at that. Uh, yeah, so all good. Let me um, talk about the homework. Um, okay, so your homework said it's due on uh, the 16th, but the, let's, let's give an extension on that because that's too soon. You, for your homework, we want you to write an op-ed an opinion editorial. Now, an op-ed 
is something you see every day in papers like the New York Times or the Financial Times or the Washington Post. And the idea there is we want you to make the case for, make an ethical and economic case for a particular policy. We're going to leave this open, by the way. Unlike the last assignment, which we assigned you a particular topic, you're going to choose your own topic. The op-ed is short. It's between 700 and 1,000 words. And I, by the, and by the way, we're going to rigorously enforce that. Uh, I, don't want, I, I don't want to see anything less than 700 words, and I don't want to see anything more than 1,000 words. Because the point of writing an op-ed is to make an argument in a very in a short, uh, confined space, to make it clear. Uh, what I want you to do is imagine you are submitting an op-ed to the New York Times and write it, in that, write it in that vein, make the case. Now you can choose your own topic, make it somehow related to class, obviously. Uh, I can give you a few examples if you want. Um, um, you could uh, choose to make the case that there is a moral imperative to end extreme poverty. There's one. Um, you could say two, there is a moral imperative to reduce inequality in society today. There's another one. You could say, we need to make sure the benefits of technological change are fairly shared among all aspects, among all dimensions of society. Uh, there's another one. Um, but you can come up with your own. You can use either, you can you be, feel free to use them, come up with your own. The, the only one thing I would ask you is do not do it on the UBI because you've already done the UBI. So let's not repeat that. Um, but um, think about it. Um, let me caution you though, that this is a much shorter assignment. Um, so it shouldn't take you as long to do. That's, but on the other hand, it's often harder to write in a shorter um, uh, frame of shorter place than, than, than longer. It's, it's often harder to write shorter than longer. So keep that in mind. And the way you wanna write the op-ed is start off by state up front, your, state your case up front. And then, so state your case, up, this is a very simple way of doing it. You don't have to do it this way, but it's a simple way of doing it. You want the reader to know why should I read this op-ed? I've like, the New York Times has 10 op-eds today. Why am I gonna read this one? So make your first line very punchy, make your first line interesting. So the reader says, oh, I like this argument. I wanna see where this goes. So make your first line, state your argument up front, make your case, and then rally the arguments. What are your arguments that you're using to make this point? And then you repeat your argument at the end, say, I've I'm going to prove X, here are the arguments for X, and then this is why I've shown that X is important. So any questions on the assignment? Okay, what about the deadline? Um, let's see, does, um, does Monday the week after next work? So 16, what is that, the 19th, 16th, does that work? How about Monday the 19th? Is that okay? Okay, Olivia says yes, Hannah says yes. Okay, does anybody say no? Okay, Monday the 19th. So that gives you two weekends, including this weekend. Um, email me if you have any questions or you wanna run a topic by me, but um, I think you can have a lot of fun with this because you can choose your own topic um, make a case from anything in course in the first half or the second half. Uh, I think a lot of these questions, oh, so there's a lot of stuff going in the chat that I'm missing. Oh, Jim. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Um, okay. Um, yes. Any questions uh, before we end? Is that clear? Okay. So 700 to 1,000 words, and, and we're going to be rigorous about that. Um, so you can do the, think about poverty, the world of work, inequality, um, 
plenty of topics we have talked about uh, over the last few weeks. I think I think one reason why we're putting this assignment at this part of the course is there's a lot of very rich discussion that you can have in recent topics that we've discussed. Um, if you want, you could even make an argument as to why neoclassical economics is not good for solving the main problems of the world today, that that might be a harder op-ed to write. Um, you can talk about the religious traditions if you want. Basically, it's, it's up to you. Just make a coherent argument. I don't have to agree with the argument. As you saw with the last assignment, some of you made arguments that I didn't agree with, but you got the points because you made the arguments well. So I don't have to agree with it, uh, but you have to make your case and you have to make the case well. Uh, some, you can rally facts and figures uh, to make the case. You can rally moral arguments. There's many ways to do it. Okay. Okay. Questions? Questions on the class, questions on the assignment? Okay, everything is set then, I'm really glad. So I'll stay on the Zoom for a little bit if anybody wants to, um, a private uh, question or private chat. Uh, otherwise, have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you on Tuesday for, for, for Professor Sachs's class, okay? Thank you, Take Professor. Care, everybody. Thank you, Professor. Have a great weekend. I just had one quick question. Can you go hear ahead? Me? Yeah, Jack. Yeah. Um, going back to the the Adam Smith, like it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, all that. Yeah, that came up. Jack, you frozen. So can you say that again? You froze there. I'm sorry, my wife. Oh, you're frozen again. Jack, put it in the chat if you're frozen. Yeah, Jack, you've completely frozen at this point. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Okay, you're back. You're back. You get, get it in before you go again. <laughs> just with that quote, I was just curious what kind of your critiques were of that again um okay so that quote is basically saying that uh it's self-interest that is what matters whereas a lot of the other ethical traditions argue that what matters is not so much uh it's 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 providing a benefit to the you want to so the question is one critique is it's, it's not the benevolence of the butcher, the baker, and the brewer. It's your self-interest. But another, but another view of that is, well, you actually want to, you want to make the best bread and the best beer uh, possible because you want to, you want to provide good, uh, good service and good goods for the other side of the, of the, of the transaction. And that builds, that builds reciprocity, that builds trust, um, and all of that. So you're trying to give the other person a gain. Um, yeah, so the, the opposite would be kind of reciprocity, I would say. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear me, but I can hear you. Yes. Yes. No problem. <laughs> okay. Okay. Tony, um, are you, are you also Jack? Yes. Thanks. Oops. Now, Tony, you seem frozen. Can anybody hear me? I can hear you, Jim, but you look frozen. Uh, <laughs> I feel frozen sometimes. Jack, <laughs> am I interrupting you? Are you all done? Jack is done, yeah. Jack is frozen. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and assume I'm not interrupting him. Uh, Tony, um, the, uh, I might... Okay, now, Jim, I'm losing you. Jim, I can't hear you. It is a world of unstable internet. I know. That's a real pain. I, I do not like teaching on Zoom, it's, uh, but what can we do?
I honestly, I didn't have a question. I was just interested in hearing other people's questions. So I stuck around. <laughs> um, the class is excellent. It's really been, it's really been great. And while we're waiting for Professor Stoner to come back on, um, is everything that you, you've really taught up to now, you've gone in a number of different directions. Um, but is poverty really the culmination of all of it? If we direct all our attention to poverty, we, we can alleviate most of the other ills? Um, I think there are broader, I mean, the poverty is related to a lot of things, but I think inequality is a separate issue because inequality, yeah. you know, you're, you're talking about not just the bottom of the pile, but the top of the pile too. And the fact that the fact that you have billionaires earning so much uh, is a problem partly because there's so much poverty in the world, but it's also a problem on its own and yeah. in terms of the capture of democracy and plutocracy and all that. So I would say, I, I would argue that poverty alleviation is probably the greatest moral challenge, but in terms of this course, there are a lot of other issues too, like the future of work, inequality, climate change, which of course is related to poverty. Um, yeah, so... Thank you. I won't keep you anymore. I was no, just no really problem. just no, chatting. No problem, James. It's always good to talk. <laughs> Have a great one. Take care. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Take care.